Hello, we're back again. Wherever you're listening around the world, whether it be Boscombe, Blythe or the Bahamas, welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast, the unique insights behind the scenes and the personalities at the Cherries. I'm Chris Temple, match commentator on the Cherries for BBC Radio Solent and AFCB TV. And joining me once again is club journalist and former Daily Echo legend, Neil Perrett. I'd never been called a legend before, Chris, so thanks very much for that. It's really looking first for everything. <laughs> Really looking forward to this one. Uh, I won't reveal who it is yet. We've had the uh, first two podcasts have been fantastic with Richard Hughes and Arnout Dan Juma. So really looking forward to today's instalment. Well, we should add before we start that with current COVID safety guidelines in mind, we're recording this episode virtually, sat behind our screens in different locations. As Neil mentioned on the podcast, we've already chatted to the club's technical director, Richard Hughes, and winger Arnout Dan Juma. And listen out for an upcoming episode too with the head of sports science, Dan Hodges. But today we're heading back, metaphorically at least, into the dressing room. Our guest has just launched into his second coming here at AFC Bournemouth, a two-time FA Cup winner, 34-time England international, with almost 200 Premier League games under his belt, a fair chunk of which were for the Cherries. It's a very warm welcome to the AFC B pod, to Jack Wilshire. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you, Jack, and it's great to have you as an AFC Bournemouth player after the uh, the movements of the last week or so. Now, let's go back to, to Monday before the Derby game, signing the contract here, or being announced anyway. What did that do for you mentally? Was it relief? Um, yeah, probably a little bit of relief. Um, obviously, I w- I've been without a club for, for what felt like a long time, and it is the hardest thing is probably coping with it mentally because you're used to... You know the routine, the daily routine. Come the weekend, you're you're playing a game, and I didn't have any of that. I was trying to. Well, I had to keep myself fit, and to be honest, keeping myself fit was was easy because you know you can go out, you can train, you can do running, but trying to stay strong mentally was probably the toughest. I guess when you come to places like Bournemouth, even though they they know you already, the concept of of trying to earn a contract is like being on trial. I guess effectively somewhere is that a new one for you, having been so stable in your career for so long. Um, yeah, but to be honest, when I when I picked the phone up to to Jace, I wasn't really thinking about about signing here. To be honest, I was, you know, I, I think it was around Christmas Eve, and uh, I woke up one morning. And I just thought, you know what, I can't keep going out and and trying to motivate myself without players around me. And I, you know, I've, I've, obviously I know Jace and had a good relationship with him from my my previous time here and. Yeah, I picked up the phone and just wanted to come back down and train. Obviously, I'm, I've, I've still got friends here, so I wanted to be around them and be around um, other players. And yeah, from you know from the moment I walked through the door, I've said it. I felt welcomed. It felt right. It felt natural to be here. And you know, as the week went on and then went into the, the next week, I started to think about maybe I I could try and earn myself a contract here, and I've done that. What difference has it made to you, Jack, even over the last few days, that, that training is now about earning a place in the team and winning matches again rather than just working individually on your fitness? Yeah, well, it it, it changes everything because you're now you're preparing for, for a game after game. And there's a lot of games in, in this league, by the way, which I've, I've learned pretty quick. Um, yeah, it, it makes a massive difference. You've got something at the end of the week or even midweek to look forward to and... You know, I'm still probably working on my fitness a bit as well because obviously I haven't played in a while. But I think obviously match fitness comes from from playing matches. So I'm looking forward to the games that we've got coming up and I want to get involved as soon as possible. Jack, it's interesting that you said that you picked up the phone to Jason Tindall on, on Christmas Eve. You're surrounded by clubs on your doorstep where you live. What, why was it JT that you rang? Probably because... The relationship I had with him when I was here previously, um, obviously he wasn't the manager, he was the assistant manager and um, I got I got to know him a lot and he was really helpful for me. Um, I know it's a cliche, but he actually, he really was like, obviously it was sometimes when, when you're in the thick of a season, it's difficult to speak to the manager, you know, and don't get me wrong, I got on really well with, with Eddie and had a good relationship with him, but you know, he's got a lot of things going through his head and, you know, Jace would pull me to the side a few times and, and help me out. Um, so, I don't know, it just felt natural. And, you know, I mean, obviously I played at Arsenal before, but it still felt it still felt more natural to me to pick up the phone to someone like Jace, who, 
who I think understood my my situation as well, and he was really helpful. So I'm thankful thankful to him for that. In his interview about you coming back, Jason said that you had unfinished business here. Jack, is that how you see it? Yeah, I said that to him when when we first spoke about me potentially signing till the end of the season, and you know, I didn't like the way it ended last time. Um, obviously, it, it was no one's fault. It just them, these things happen in football, but you know, I felt like. I mean, we had a really good season. I had, I felt I had a good season, and I enjoyed my time down here. But you know, I wanted to finish it off properly, and you know, to to end it like that was was not nice. And I still, even you know, normally when the players on loan and and you get injured, you go back to your club. And um, obviously, I went back to Arsenal for the for a week or so, and to find out what I'd actually done. But even after that, you know, because I had such a good relationship with even the medical team here I came back down here to do some of my rehab and but yeah I wanted to I still haven't scored a goal for the Cherries and I want to do that um, and I think well I know that this is a club that belongs in the Premier League after after five years there and with the, the talent they got in this squad it would be such a shame for the young players not to experience playing for this club in the Premier League and I want to help help them do that I know the result wasn't ideal in the in the first game you played at Derby. You had a cameo there. Just tell us, what was it like, first of all, to be back on the pitch? And I'm intrigued to know what you were chatting to Wayne Rooney about after the final whistle. Um, first of all, getting back on the pitch was was massive. It didn't even it didn't really feel real until until I was actually on the pitch. You know, I mean, because obviously when I was at at West Ham, I spent a lot of time. You know, on the bench and watching games in, you know, with no fans, and it and it got tough, and it felt like. So I watched a, a few games from the bench, and, um, you know, on Tuesday night I was started on the bench, which you know I knew I was going to anyway, and. You know, as well, I didn't I didn't realize as well during the game that um, you can have five subs. So when the third sub went on, I thought no, I'm not coming on today. Then obviously, and, and then uh, and then we made another one, and I came on, and I thought okay, so yeah, it was. It was a good feeling being back on the pitch, um, and then you know I played with Rooney for five or six years with England, and to see him as a manager now was a bit strange. So I was just I was just speaking to him and asking him if he's enjoying it, and he said it's completely different, which I I could imagine. Um, but no, to be fair, I I think he'll he'll be a good manager, and you know if, if he's your manager as a player, you're going to earn his respect straight away. So. Yeah, good luck to him. In your signing interview with AFCB.co.uk, you highlighted the quality of the coaching and playing staff here. Just sort of elaborate on that a little bit, Jack, because quite a lot has changed in coaching staff and playing staff since you were here before. Mm. Yeah, when I when I came down here last time, it was it was different to anything I've ever ever experienced in terms of the coaching. Um, the man management and the one-to-one you get with coaches and the relationship the players have with coaches and the manager um, and nothing's changed I mean obviously the manager's changed and a few other coaches have changed Bonner's come in um, but it's still the same you can still have that dialogue with coaches and they're honest and upfront with you they're open with you if, if you want to discuss something with them their door's always open and as well they're always there at the end of training, if you need anything else to that you feel like if it's an extra fitness or you want to improve on your finishing or something, they're always there to help. And that was something that really opened my eyes when I first came down here, you know, because I'd obviously been been at Arsenal for, for my whole career and it was different, you know, Arsene Wenger had his own way of doing things. He, you know, it wasn't the same culture as it is here. And you know, that opened my eyes and I really enjoyed it. So. Yeah, I mean, the level of coaching and and the detail you get is really good here. Just um, on a similar subject, the younger players that you have seen uh, in the last three or four weeks, the players that you wouldn't have seen when you were here on loan before, what have what have you made of those people? I'm looking at people like Namdi Offerbore, Gavin Kilkenny, Jade Anthony. I could reel off seven or eight new new players to you probably. Yeah, no, the level is really high. Um, obviously, I. I've actually spent a lot of time with them over the last two or three weeks because 
the boys who were playing were obviously traveling and you know sometimes obviously when you're a young player you 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 don't travel and they weren't and I was training with them and you know they're good lads first of all I think that's the most important thing you know I've I've played with a lot of good young players who whose attitude weren't right and you know they never get anything out of it so I think that's the main thing and they're willing to learn and as I said they've got a a culture and an atmosphere here where they can get what they want out of coaching out they can pick the brains of of the the experienced players and yeah they've got what I think a lot of them and I think as well sometimes I know no one wants to be relegated but for some players and and some young players it gives them a chance again to to play a lot of games to get their back to the level and and show everyone what they can do Jack, you said in your uh, your signing interview, and you mentioned it already today, that you said it, you felt like you'd never really been away from the club, even though it's been, what, you know, the best part of nearly four years. What is it about the fabric of Bournemouth that makes it maybe a little bit different to, to others at the top level? Because when they were in the Premier League, people used to say Bournemouth were completely unique at Premier League level. Yeah, I think it's it's the whole the whole community, the whole club. You know, everyone everyone is positive. Everyone wants to see Bournemouth do well. Um the fans, they, you know, I, I I often ask that question when I was first down here, and you soon realise when you walk through the door, you know, the journey the club have been on, and and the history of the club, and and as well the manager, when I was here before, used to used to say that to us all the time, where they've come from, where they are now, and no one forgets that. So they're very, it's a very humble club, and you know, as well, I spoke when I when I first signed about the absolute things you have to do 100% or you're not going to play here and that's you know your hard work you have to give your all for the club and not just on on match day you you represent the whole club when you're when you're training when you're outside the club and it's a whole culture and I think that's why I, I really enjoy my time here and like it's almost like once you're you're in that and part of that family you're never really out of it um you know I've always received a lot of love from Bournemouth fans on on social media and you know, wherever I've been, they've always looked for, looked out for me, and and it's the same for me. Whenever, you know, when I was away from the club, I was always looking out for the results, speaking to the lads here because I've got I've got friends here um, that I met when I was here last time. They're still my friends, so I think it's that family feel club that that attracted me to it. Yeah, I remember a nice tweet from you actually when the when the team got relegated uh, back from the Premier League. Um, just reflecting on the last few months for you, we'll come back to your previous spell in a, in a short while. But I heard you say that going abroad was probably your first choice after leaving West Ham at the start of October. What what offers and interest did you have that you, you considered to to possibly make that happen? I know the MLS you've you've talked about and maybe other leagues in Europe as well. What what interest did you have prior to signing for Bournemouth? Um, I had a few. Um, a few from Europe. I'm obviously not going to mention clubs. I don't think it'll be fair. Um, a few from like the Middle East, but nothing that really, like I thought, yeah, I really want to do that. I really fancy that. Um, and, you know, as well, it was me saying that before, but it's because I never really had the option that I wanted in England. Um you know, and as I said, when I when I picked the phone up to Jace, it, I didn't ever think that, you know, I might sign here or I want to sign here. It was just I I generally wanted to to keep my fitness up at a place where I felt comfortable. And um, you know, I remember when I, mean, I think it was about a week, maybe ten days into my my training here, and my agent rang me and said, "Oh, um, Bournemouth have asked if if you're interested and like, I had the biggest smile on my face and that's why I say it, that felt natural and you know speaking to my wife who who loves it down here who, you know she's got friends from from her time down here and you know it just felt natural and it put a smile back on my face again and it's been a while since I've I've played football with a smile on my face and I think that's when not just me but any player plays his best football is when when they're happy you just touching on your family there. You mentioned that. How big a part of, of that side of football is important for you at this stage of your, your career as well? And, and will you move your family down at any point? How's it working at the moment in, in a lockdown situation? Yeah, so it's difficult at the moment because um, all the hotels are closed. So I've actually got a, a little place on Air, on Airbnb, which um, which is great, but it's, it's only temporary. So um, yeah, I'm going to look to 
to rent something down here. Um, it's different from, from when I was here before because with my wife now, I've got two kids. Um, so it's not literally, you know, there's a few things that you have to sort out before you come, but my, but she would love to come down here. I mean, she, she loved her time down here. Um, my older kids as well. Um, my, my son now is, is nine, nearly 10. And, you know, he, that, when I, when I first came down here, that was sort of his first memory of me playing football. So he always, you know, associated me with Bournemouth and he was, you know, I rang him when I was coming to sign on Monday and he was absolutely buzzing, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, I think that is a big part of it. When your when your family's happy, it makes you happy, and when you're happy, you can play the best football. When you've been in the Premier League your, your whole career, as you have, Jack, is there any element of having to suck up your pride a little bit to say I'm going to step down to the Championship? No, I don't think so because the, the people who matter to you most um, and have been through the dark times with you and the good times, you know. It's almost like you look to them for guidance and and you trust them and you trust their their thoughts. But as well, you have to do what feels right for yourself. And as I said, when, when I found out that Bournemouth were interested, you know, I was driving home and I couldn't keep a smile off my face. So it just felt right to me. And listen, I'm I I don't feel like I have to I owe anything to anyone or my pride is is, is important. I mean I know when when I wake up in the morning, I look in the mirror that if I'm if I'm happy and I'm at a place where I feel comfortable and it gives me an opportunity to play my best football. Okay, it might be in the division lower, but I think I'll learn quickly that this this division isn't an easy division where you're going to get things that go everything goes your way. You're going to have to fight, and you know I think I played always play my best football when when there's something to fight for, and you know. That, that things are difficult and listen it's not going to be easy in this league as we found out the last two games we, we really going to have to dig deep and that's what I like to do and I'm looking forward to it Let's go back to Arsenal um, Jack um, why did you feel you needed to leave there after what was it probably the best part of 17 years wasn't it because you joined them when you were nine um, they offered you a new contract of course under Unai Emery didn't they after after Wenger left but what was it that in you that thought I've got to, I've got to sort of change my situation here when, I, when you left Arsenal um, there was a, a number of things, but one of the big things was obviously I'd been on loan the season before my last year at Bournemouth. I'd done well. Unfortunately, it ended um, with injury. And I, I went back to to Arsenal that pre-season. Um, I, was, I wasn't fully fit. I mean, I was still, I was still injured, I think. And coming back I was a bit behind the group and obviously Arsene Wenger was still there and you know I had an open conversation with him and he said if you if you can find something you know you can leave because we're not going to offer you a new deal um, but I knew that the trust he had in me and you know he was always brilliant with me from from my previous injuries coming back and you know so I knew if I got myself really fit and available and and played a few. We were, we was in the Europa League as well, and you know, with all, all the games. I knew I was going to get an opportunity, and you know, I, I worked really hard and managed to get myself back in the team, and you know, to the point where they offered me a new deal. And you know, I'll be honest, I, I was I was ready to sign it, and then the Arson left, and I wanted to wait um, to see who the new manager was before I signed because you know, I didn't want to be in a position where. I'm just not in his plans. And after sitting down with him, he made it pretty clear that I wasn't in his plans. And, you know, I just felt after working so hard, being told that I'm not getting a new deal, working so hard to get that new deal and then to almost be put back in a, like, okay, you, you can sign the deal, but you're not going to play for me. I didn't want that. I felt it was an important stage in my career where I had to get on the pitch as much as possible. So I decided to go somewhere where, where I thought I'd play. Jack, how did you feel when you found out that Arsene Wenger was leaving Arsenal? Um, it was a tough one to take because, I mean, if we were honest as, as players, it was probably coming for a couple of years. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't happy because I felt he he could have done at least another year, 
you know, with uh, with everything he'd done for the club, and I mean, you, you can see now how how important he was to the club because you know they're they're worse off now than they they were when when he was there. You know, he kept top four, top four, and and it, and it wasn't enough for fans, and it probably they were probably right. It, it wasn't enough, but now you look at it and think what an amazing job he did to keep keep in the top four. I know we dropped out the last year or so, but for all them years, I think I can't remember 15 years in a row or something to stay in the Champions League and give the fans them, them Champions League nights. I mean, every single one of them would, would snap your hand off it, snap your hand off for it now. And and yeah, I mean, it, it was a tough time in my career because I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was still speaking to, to Arsene and, um, and it almost changed his my relationship with him because he went from my manager from the Arsenal manager my manager to offer me a new deal to then I could use him for advice what he thinks and it was him who said wait wait until the new manager comes in because you know you might get someone who, who's not interested in you and he, it turned out he was right we all know what he was like publicly Jack just tell us what he was like Privately, if you, I don't mean privately like that. I mean, but to you personally, was he almost like a father figure in footballing terms? Yeah, he was a hundred percent. Yeah, he was. He was someone who was always honest, whether it, whether you liked it or you didn't like it. And there could be times where you, you come. You know, he wasn't the most vocal manager, and he wouldn't call you in his office and say you done this. But you know, there'll be times where you're walking out to training together, and he'll say something to you, and it really sticks with you, and 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 you take that into the next game and it helps you and so he was he was very clever with the way he 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 dealt with players and you know because every manager is is going to experience problems because you know you can't play every player and every player wants to play i think that's that every manager would probably say that's the hardest thing for them when dealing with uh dropping someone or not playing someone and he was so good at that like he would be honest with you. Like you'd never leave a conversation with him thinking like, what's he talking about? He'd, he'd always make you understand it. And, and yeah, I mean, for me he was, you know, from when I was, when I was 16, um, he, like, I remember my first preseason, um, my first preseason with the first team, I was 16 and, um, I didn't expect to be involved like you know what it's like in preseason when when you when you come back I think it was after after a Euro, uh, European Championships a lot of the players were still were still on their holidays like your favorite gas the Van Persies who'd been playing with their national team were still away so obviously a few young players go over and and ever since then he he looked after me he obviously saw something in me that he liked and wanted to to sort of give me special treatment um, he took me away with the first team that preseason. He uh, gave me a place in the in the dressing room and made me grow up really quick. And yeah, I'm forever thankful for him for what he's done for me. I think you've probably answered the next question, Jack. And a lot of water has gone under the bridge between you and Arsene since he left and you left. But if he was still there, would you still be there? <laughs> um, I would have definitely signed the contract. And but then you, you know you never know what what could happen in football. Um, it's easy to say that I would, but you never know. He could have gone the next year or the year after that. But um, if he'd if he'd have been there, I would have signed a contract. Reflecting on your spell for West Ham, um, why why do you think perhaps it didn't work out as you probably would have hoped? I think a, a couple of reasons, to be honest. Um, one being when I first went there, you know, I, I was really enjoying it. I was playing. We didn't have a great start. I think we lost the first four games and then I picked up an injury that kept me out for uh, six or seven weeks. And, you know, when I got injured, the team obviously sort of found itself. They found a way of playing and, and then they started to win games. And it's difficult to come back from injury and get straight back in the team because it's hard for the manager to change a, um, a winning team. And then, Obviously, you get frustrated and you think, okay, I need to work harder in training. And then I picked up another injury and it it went from there. So my first season wasn't great. And I came back towards the end of the season and 
Um, I got fit. I played a few games and uh, I spoke to the manager and said, look, he said, look, I want you to play uh, more games next year. And what like we worked out a way of what, what's going to work for me and how we're going to get to that position. And again, the same thing happened the next year. You know, uh, I played the first few games. We got beat 5-0 against Man City. And, you know, when, again, it's, it's difficult for, for a manager to uh, to not change things and he did and and then I picked up a, an injury which was totally new to me which I found really hard because I'd never had a like a, a problem in my groin it was a hernia which is a standard problem but for me it was a new thing and I thought oh my god like what is this pain it was quite a bad pain and I just thought it was going to be a difficult road back and then uh, obviously the manager got sacked and Moisey came in and um and had a different way of playing and I respected I respected that um, I wasn't really part of his plans because of the way he wanted to play football and and I was fine with that but um, I thought you know I'm going to keep my head down work hard lockdown came work hard till till uh, we're safe and we got the opportunity to go again next season maybe I'll get in the team and then he made it pretty pretty clear pretty soon that I wasn't so we, we, we came to the decision to terminate my contract and you know, I'm, I'm thankful for West Ham for doing that because I didn't have to do that. You know, I didn't want to, I could, and as well, I could have sat there and, and just picked up all my money and, and been happy, but I couldn't, I wanted to get out and I wanted to, to play games for myself really, because it'd been a frustrating two years and, you know, I still feel like I've got a lot to give in football and I want to, I want to show myself I can do that. Jack, just one more on West Ham, and I know that hindsight is obvious. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. When you write your career memoirs, will that go down as a regret in your career signing for West Ham? No, I don't think so because I, I obviously grew up a, a West Ham fan, and if you'd have told me as a seven, eight-year-old boy that I'm going to play for West Ham's first team um, in front of all the fans, that'd have been a dream for me, and it's a dream come true to to have completed that and. Done that, you know, a lot of my family are West Ham fans as well. So I wouldn't look at it as a regret. No, I mean, obviously things didn't work out the way they did, but and that's in the past now. I want to focus on what's in front of me and I wish them all the best. They're doing really well this season and I'm happy for them. But in terms of myself, I want to focus what's in front of me rather than what's behind me. Talk to us, Jack, about the differences in playing style. When you go from Arsenal, obviously a, a top four team who have a lot of the ball and, and dominate games. You mentioned already about it was a, a change of style at West Ham. So for a player like you who wants to be on the ball, making things happen, that, that's a, a completely different style. I think I, I read you said you'd rather change league than have to change your, your playing style if you weren't at one of the big clubs in the Premier League. Yeah, I think um, when you play for a team like Arsenal or a top team, um, and when you've got a manager who who wants to play possession football, but a lot of it also depends on who you're playing against. And a lot of times when I was playing for Arsenal in the Premier League, teams would sit back. You know, I mean, I'm mean out of possession and try and hit you on the counter, and it would be down to to us to break them down or me individually because I was one of the creative players, and I really enjoyed that that role, and I. You know, then obviously moving to West Ham and it's a totally, you know, but even when I was at Bournemouth on loan, I experienced that a bit. But Eddie was a manager who wanted to play. You know, he want, he he looked at it, if we got the ball, the opposition can't score. And, you know, obviously it was, it was difficult at times to keep the ball against the big teams because they would have the ball so much that when you won it back to keep it was difficult because they, they pressed so well as well. But... You know, that season we were really, really good at that. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, when you... It's difficult because it's, it's it's managers as well and managers' style of play and you have to respect that because obviously David Moyes is a manager who's been successful in the Premier League for years and years with teams playing that style of, of football. So I obviously respected that and, you know, and I, I, I learned pretty quick that... I probably wasn't going to play and if I did play I wasn't playing the position that I wanted to so yeah I think that was a, a big part of my decision as well and, and looking at Bournemouth again as well a team who want to keep the ball played attacking football 
Um, probably one of the best teams in this league at doing that. So opposition, as we saw the other night against Derby, the opposition are going to sit back and, and it's down to us to break them down. I think that suits me better as a player. Yeah, I think Bournemouth fans, given the way the goals have just dried up a little bit, will be delighted to hear that you're pretty experienced as a, I guess, as a player trying to unlock defences from your Arsenal days. You, you obviously see that as a as a carryover that might help you in this little spell for Bournemouth. Yeah, as well. I think, you know, there's we've got a few other players who can do that. You know, I look, obviously, as you said, I haven't played with a lot of the players here, but I've, I've always watched Bournemouth when I can. And from my small, short time in, in training, you can see there's a lot of quality players who who like to, to play similar to me in terms of try and break teams down, like to run with the ball and, and make things happen. And I think we just need to get a little bit of confidence back. Um, you know, we lost the last two games and that's difficult for players to take. And we need to be leaders now and and stand up. You know, I don't mean, it doesn't mean that Steve Cook has to be the one shouting at the back, you know, as captain. I mean, as players, of as individuals is, is our job to to perform the best we can to help the team and it's time to do that now. Let's rewind then, Jack. Let's talk about your 16-17 your season here because I know, as you've already said a couple of times, it holds happy memories for you. Um, but let's talk about before you actually got here in in that spell because about 20 clubs, I think, were interested if the newspapers are to be believed and often they're not, uh, were interested in taking you on loan. Before you, you got to know about Bournemouth as intricately as you did, why did you choose Bournemouth over those other 19 reported clubs to come here in the first place? Uh, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, I'm, I met probably about five or six managers um, in London the day before and I spoke to another five or six probably on the phone and as soon as I met Jason, Eddie, I was, you know, it was an easy decision for me. Um, and that, I'm not joking when I say that, like, and that was no disrespect to the other managers. They just made it clear the way they want to play and where they see me playing and how I'd fit in. And I, I just felt I wanted to be a part of that. Obviously, I had uh, a good friend here in Benick who could who could back their story up as well and, and told me, you know, that that is how they want to play. They want to play attacking football. You know, it's a fun place to be around. Training was intense and it was a good place to be around. And yeah, it was an easy decision once I met them too. Jack, apart from playing 27 Premier League games, which I know was a massive thing for you at the time when you were trying to get games, what were the biggest takeaways for you from your your first time down here? I know you've, you've touched on a couple of them already, but but as a player, maybe your mental state at the time and getting yourself back to some sort of sharpness, what were your biggest takeaways from that spell here? Um, I learned a lot tactically um, because of the detail of the coaching and, you know, the way they wanted us to execute that. And I think we, we as a team were brilliant at that, that season, you know, executing a game plan. And I learned a lot off the ball. Um, obviously, as I said before, I was at Arsenal who, you know, for 75, 80% of the game had the ball. And um, I learned a lot positionally defending, against, you know, against the big teams. I remember we went to, to Liverpool away and we played a 4-4-2 system and, you know, we got a 2-2 draw, which was a massive result for us at the time. And, you know, we put in a defensive performance, not just the defenders, but as a team in terms of where we were on the pitch, we covered ground and, you know, I took a lot from that. Um, and as well, a big thing at that stage of my career, you talk about mentally, was enjoying my football again. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd been injured a lot and missed a lot of football. And it always felt like I was trying to like prove myself again when I was coming back at Arsenal obviously it's um, there's high expectations at a club like Arsenal and don't get me wrong there's still high expectations here but I had time I had a whole season to build up to that and you know the medical team looked after me here and I got back to a place where I trusted my body again I had a smile back on on my face I know I got injured at the end of it but you know it was an impact injury that can happen at any time you're of your career. So yeah, I took a lot, but the biggest thing was probably getting a smile back on my face again. My experience, Jack, is that footballers have very good memories about landmarks in their career. How good are you at remembering your debuts? Any any memories of your Cherries debut for you four and a bit years ago? Yeah, it was against West Brom, right? Spot on. I came on and uh, Will scored the little flick, didn't he? Wilson. Very good. I tell you what, if we're going to really stretch you, who did you replace? Can you remember that to come on? 
Or we are we are stretching. No, it's Jordan Ibe. <laughs> Nearly. So we, that's three out of four, though. Not bad. I remember my first start as well. Do you remember that one? Oh, you might have got me here. City away, and we got smashed five nil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a bad one. I'd just like to refute. Chris's claim as a former newspaper reporter myself, Jack, uh, that you can't believe everything you read in the papers. Um, that's not true. Um, <laughs> you can believe very, very little, though, I can assure you. Anyway, when you signed on loan here, Jack, you were the highest profile, most highest profile signing the club had ever made. There's no question about that. What was it like coming from Arsenal, the change of culture and the change of environment, if you like? Because Bournemouth are never going to profess that they are at the same level, if you like, in terms of um, infrastructure of a club like Arsenal. What was that like for you? Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that part of it. Um, you know, stepping out of my comfort zone, moving away from from everything that at the time wasn't good to be around because, you know, I'd had, I think I'd had, six or seven months injured the season before and I wasn't in a good place mentally so to move down here you know with it was literally just me and the missus at the time just literally packed our bags came stayed in the Hilton for a, a couple of weeks and found a place and, and made it like our home and you know I really enjoyed that part as well and as well as going to the club with a really good group of honest lads who who I, I felt like they respected me but at the same time treating me like just I was another another player another another person not that I'd come from a big club or and I really respect I really like that and, and thank the thank the boys for that because they were a big part of making me feel so comfortable so quickly and I was I was nervous when when I was driving down to sign the first time because I'd only ever known Arsenal and obviously I knew Benick here but I knew that a big part of this team and the, and the club is, is is team spirit. And I wanted to be able to fit in with that. I had no doubt I would, but I didn't think that the boys would make it so easy for me and make me feel so comfortable so quick. Is there any truth in the rumour that your Spurs supporting uncle was delighted when you signed here because it actually meant he could come and watch you play? That is true. That is very true. He sent me a text saying, all these years and I can finally watch you play now. <laughs> Just on the same subject, Spurs, Darren Anderton um, finished his career with Bournemouth in 2008. He was um, in the twilight of his career, a lot, um, well, seven or eight years older than you are now. Now, although he had a lot of injury problems during his career, he hardly missed a game when he was here. You also played regularly here. Is that a coincidence or is it just a nice place to play? Could be to see air. <laughs> now, um, as I said before, the medical team here really, really looked after me at a point of my career where I really needed it. You know, I'm I'm at a different stage in my career now, and I feel like I've I've got to know my body better myself. But at that time, you know, I wanted to train every day. I wanted to show myself every day, and I I, I used to have this thing in my head: if I didn't train for one day, I, I, it wouldn't be right. I wouldn't be able to play at the weekend. And you know, the medical team, I worked hard with them. Um, you know, they'd pull me out of training some days. I'd be like, I want to train, I want to train. And, you know, we'd have full on arguments saying, no, I'm training. And they're like, no, you're not. you got a game on Saturday. And, you know, it wasn't really until I left the next season where I really thought about it and really like, appreciated the work they'd done for me. And, you know, as you said, I mean, I played a lot of games here that season, especially at that that stage of my career. And it was only an impact injury that, that stopped that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe they, the the medical team, or the manager. It always helps as well where you have a manager who understands, who understands what you need as an individual, as an athlete. You know, because not every player is the same. You know, I don't need the same as Steve Cook, who's a centre half. Or you know, every player has their own thing that helps them, and it's about finding that and having a manager that allows you to work that way. Funny story about Darren Anderton. I once heard that he was in a restaurant and some some people were taunting him, chanting sick note at him, and he turned around and said, no, it's not sick note anymore. It's pound note, they call me now. Now, <laughs> Jack, I know that you've had um, 
similar injury problems in your career. Now, what's that like to deal with? I mean, it's one thing having to deal with being injured, but then it's another thing to having to deal with the criticism of it as well. What's that been like for you? Um, you know what? It's not really the criticism that, that affects me because... Uh, because I, to put it bluntly, I don't really care what other people think of, of me. I know that, yes, I've had my injury problems, but it's through no fault of my own. You know, I'm not the type of player who, who just thinks, oh yeah, I'm injured again. I want to be back on, I want to be on the pitch. I want to be helping my team. And, you know, I, it comes down to the fact that simply I love football and, you know, I think it's it's sometimes difficult to people to see it like that because obviously we get paid well and we, we still get paid when we're injured and some people think, oh, he's happy, he's he's getting paid when he's injured, but it doesn't work like that and I don't know any player that is like that. So that doesn't it might have affected me when um when I was younger and you know, when I was new to social media and you get all all these comments coming through on your phone and sometimes it was it was difficult to take but now you know as an experienced player who's who's been through a lot you know I know what what I can bring as a player when I'm fit and all I can do is try and be as fit as fit as I can as much as possible and that's why I'm here and I want to play as many games as I can between now and the end of the season and, and show myself and you know the, the people who love me my family my kids what I can do not show everyone else what I can do because I don't feel like I need to Jack, how much have you had to change your game over the years to try and avoid those injuries in recent seasons? Have you uh, again? I, I read or heard you say that you know you, as a player who's on the ball a lot, you do you are prone to I guess impact injuries and things like that. H- how much have you changed to to try and manage injuries, if you like, or or your susceptibility to them? Um, I don't think I have changed, and I don't think I mean maybe I've changed a little bit in training. You know, from when I was younger, and I used to chuck myself into challenges in training. You know, I've learned as as I've got older, yes, training's important and there's things you need to work on to improve individually and as a team. But the real work is Saturday at three o'clock and that's when you need to give your all and that's when you need to put your body on the line. And that's just the type of player I am. So I'll always be that guy who, who wants to run with the ball and make things happen, as I said. Um you know, I've I've watched a few of my injuries in the past, and yeah, there've been silly silly tackles that I've thrown myself into. So probably I, I could I could change that, but as well, it's, it's difficult in in the heat of the moment when you're caught up in the game and you want to you want to win and you're fighting for every ball. You know, sometimes you you don't even think and you just go for something and it's too late. So I'll try and be more careful, but I can't promise anything. <laughs> uh, we haven't even mentioned England yet I mean we've been going with you 40 odd minutes we'll come to England in a second but I wanted to I guess fuse two parts of it together because I wanted to talk about your position uh, in midfield and, and where you see yourself uh, I've heard you say that maybe actually the defensive midfielder position was, was arguably your favourite and actually was it Roy Hodgson in your England career who was the first manager really to, to ever put faith in you there yeah it was um, it was Roy and his coaching staff when Gary Neville was there and Gary, you know, it was after um, what was it, 2014 World Cup when Gerard had uh, just retired and he'd left that position. And uh, you know, Gary Neville said to me, "I want to play. I want you to play that position." I was like, "Well, I couldn't see myself playing that position." And we sat down and went through it, and I actually really, really enjoyed it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do like that position, but as well, I can. I think. The, with the formation we play and the way we play here, that gives you that license in midfield to rotate and get on the ball. And and the man, I know the manager likes that. He wants players to come and get on the ball and, you know, keep possession. So if you're in the eight or the 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 four position, I think you can you have license to go and get the ball. And, and that's the most important thing for me. How impressed have you been with Lewis Cook in that sort of uh, that four position this season as another bright English midfielder? Yeah, what impresses me most about him is his confidence and character to get on the ball and make things happen. You know, when I, I was here with him before and he was he was a young player and he had a tough year with injuries. Um, and then the year I left as well, he, he, he's been through a lot as for such a young player and he's played a lot of games as well. So he's obviously a strong character who who um, who's been through a lot. So yeah, 
I like him. I really like him in that position. I think was it against Stoke when he set Junior up, and there's been a few times where he's he's played that ball and he's got that ability. He's got that awareness to get on the ball and and look up. And I think that thing that always surprises me, and this has been a thing for years and years. Like in England, sometimes that position is like a a centre half who can play football. You know, who just breaks things up and gives it simple. But I think. It could be so much more, and and you know, someone like Lewis Cook, who yeah, he can get about the pitch and he can make tackles, but one of his best attributes is probably his passing and his ability to to start attacks. And yeah, he's he's had a really good season so far, and let's hope it can continue. Is your personality one that would go and offer things to Lewis Cook without being prompted on the training ground? Little tidbits of of advice and things, or are you one who would wait for him to come to you? Um, no, I would go to him if if I felt. There's something that that could help him, um, but he's he's a type of character as well who who's always asking questions and you know he wants to learn. Um, he loves football. He's that type of guy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if if I felt like I could help him, I, he, at a minute he, he looks like he don't need much help. So <laughs> I'll leave him to it for now. Uh, we've touched on England. It would be remiss not to uh, not to go further into that because you you know you had some 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 ups and downs, I guess, with England as a lot of people did in the the period that, that you were there. Um, Thirty four caps. What are your personal highlights of your international career? What are the the standout moments for you? Um, the one that stands out the most is probably when I scored uh, the two goals in one game in in a World Cup qualifier. So, I mean, scoring you grow up in the playground pretending to be. England players scoring, so to score for your country was was a dream come true, um, and probably in, up there with it, going to the World Cup, getting selected for the World Cup, giving the number seven shirt at the World Cup. Um, when I grew up, my hero was David Beckham, who obviously wore number seven for England, so that was that was a big moment. I know it wasn't a good World Cup, but it was still a dream to be involved in it. Jack, is there a 35th cap in you? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, listen, I think the most important thing for me is at the moment to focus on getting on the pitch, playing games, playing well, helping the team. And then you never know. I mean, it's not something I think of. You know, it wasn't something that when I had all the when I had three months out. You know, it wasn't something that crossed my mind. Oh, I want to play for England again. Of course, I want to play for England, but in the short term, it's it's not something that's on my mind now. Are you excited by the current crop of England players and the team when you watch them? Yeah, I'm excited, and I also feel a bit sorry for Gareth Southgate because he's got to pick a squad to go to the Euros um, out of all of them. You know, in that sort of ten position or, or wide position which is going to be very difficult because you know there's some some players who seems as well now to be coming into to form just at the right time so it's going to be a difficult decision for him Jack is there anything that you haven't achieved in your career that really burns with you and if you could put winning promotion from the championship high on your list that would be much appreciated <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know what like I've, I've been speaking about this with a few of the lads and they've asked me the same question like would winning an FA Cup or winning promotion, what what's bigger? And you know, like, listen, let's hope we get um, or automatic promotion in the top two. But if we don't, and we have to go through the playoffs, I think you know, just thinking about that game makes me a little bit nervous. And you know, I think that is one of the biggest, if not the biggest game. I mean, it's the biggest prize in in football is the Premier League, obviously, and. So I think, yeah, that would have to be up there and let's hope we can make it come true. Jack, just one final one from me and you've mentioned Benicophobia a couple of times during this podcast and a um, very popular player when he was here and I know how close you are with him. Just just um, for Bournemouth supporters who will be listening in, just tell us how he is at the moment. Obviously, we're everyone's fully aware of what's what happened in his life. Yeah, no, Benic... Benick surprised me the whole way through what he went through. I mean, he obviously went through hell and something that is just 
you can't even begin to think of what what him and his family went through and are still going through because I mean that's not something that that just goes away that lives with you and you know I think if I mean obviously I know Benick well but as you said the fans here really took to Benick and I think he's that type of character who who people just like you know he's he's always happy he's always smiling um, and he, he he's still that guy and for him to been through what he he has and still be that guy is you know he amazes me I speak to him you know every other day he's obviously in in Turkey and um he's he's tried something different in his career he's enjoying it I think he's doing well he scored a few goals he, I think he's out of the team at the minute but you know listen I love Benick and his family and what he went through I wouldn't wish on any on on your worst enemy, let alone your, your your best friend. And you know he's come out of it the other side. He was he was injured at the time as well. People forget that he he had a, an ACL injury at the time, and to come back from you know I've, I've been injured, and it's difficult to come back. But to add that on top of it, you know, he he's a strong character, and you know let's hope he 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 goes on in his career to achieve all the things he wanted to, and and. In, his family, you know, his mum, his dad, they, they find happiness. Yeah, we'd certainly echo that, Jack. Absolutely. I'm sure we wish everybody uh, connected with the Afobo family the best. Um, Jack, just a, a couple more before we, uh, we, we let, you, uh, let you go. First of all, social media um, as players, uh, I know obviously you have to learn, I guess, to deal with it and mute your notifications and all the other things that come with uh, profile. But I mean, even Raheem Sterling's been on to you this week, isn't he, on social media giving you some stick. But how much of a part of that is a learning curve as a footballer as well? And, and what have you got to say back to Raheem after giving you a bit of tap this week? <laughs> I think it's a big part of of a football a young footballer's career now because of how big it is in the game and you know there's no really there's no getting away from it um you know I mean I think the sooner a young player learns that there're always going to be people that that are going to be negative because you know, if you play for Bournemouth, then Southampton fans might be negative. If you play for Arsenal, you got Tottenham fans. That's just the way, the way that football is, and that's why we love football as well because it creates that rivalry. And I think obviously there's there's lines that people cross, but if you can learn to to use that to inspire you and you know push you on, and you, I think it can be really helpful. Um, uh, and in terms of Raheem I mean Raheem is like a social media specialist he knows everything so I didn't even <laughs> think there was a problem with that but clearly there was <laughs> just in case you haven't seen it and you're listening to this it's an issue with Jack's uh, cropping of a photo or non-cropping I'm sure if you look up Jack or Raheem on social media uh, you'll see what we're talking about um, you mentioned Jack uh, finally the I guess learning curve as a youngster and we're we're sort of starting with the, the earliest part of your career if you like how important has football been in your life maybe as a young impressionable lad when you were getting into a scrape or two off the field and a, a bit of negative publicity and early in your career how, how important has football been to, to get you I guess where you are today and to maybe take you away from other distractions in life? Yeah, no, football has always been my life from when I was a kid and I always felt free when I was, was playing football. And as well, like even, you know, to f the last three months made me realise that even more, you know, because I was at a point in, in my life, in my career, where I'd never really been, where I wasn't enjoying you know, going into training and being part of it, I wasn't really enjoying it, and that's why I worked so hard to to leave and and terminate my contract. And then, you know, I was sat at home thinking, oh, have, I, "Have I made the right decision? Like, I miss this." And the longer it went on, the, the harder it was. I just wanted to to be back, first and foremost, in and around the lads and training. And and then, the longer it went on, the more I missed like the, the playing side of it and it's always been a massive and massive part of my life and when I was younger and obviously had the, a few distractions on the pitch it was always off the pitch so it was almost like my like it was like my free place where I just was happy um, I didn't let anything come into my mind I just was on the pitch and enjoying myself 
Well, Jack, I know Bournemouth fans are going to enjoy having you uh, in the team and in the squad over the course of the uh, the next few months. Thanks so much for giving up your, your valuable time to, to address those supporters. I'm sure football fans from a, a wider audience. It's been great to have you on the uh, the official AFC Bournemouth podcast, Jack. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, Neil, as ever, it's absolutely fascinating to hear behind the scenes and behind the careers. And you read a lot about, particularly people like Jack Wilshere. We've read so much of him. We've seen a little bit of him, of course, back in 2016, 17. But that was a, a real enlightening hour. Chris, I never got the opportunity to interview Jack when he was here on loan for one reason or another. But that was absolutely riveting stuff. Very insightful, very thorough answers. Um, didn't shirk any questions. Some of them were, you know, could have been could have been construed as slightly difficult if you like you know a player you know um, it, it was just so interesting from start to finish Chris it's going to be it's going to be an absolute box office podcast and I know we aim for an hour because that's uh, around about the, uh, the the target time we're going for on this pod but we probably could have done another hour couldn't we with him because there's so we only scratched on his England career we only really scratched on his Arsenal career as well we probably could have doubled the, the length of this couldn't we well, yeah, I mean, um, there, there's so much to talk about in, su- you know, such a short space of time, if you like, you know, 29 years old, so many experiences, been in the game for 20 years, even though he's only 29. So much has happened to him, so many ups and downs, like you said, you know, the injuries, the England caps, coming here on loan, coming back here. Everything's just so, we use, use the word fascinating, and that's exactly what it was. Neil, thank you as ever for uh, being my sidekick on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. That is it for this episode. Don't forget to subscribe where you ever get your, wherever you get your podcasts and give us a rating as well and share us on social media. Our hashtag is AFCBpod. Don't forget your club updates on the website afcb.co.uk for fixture news and where to buy your match pass and of course when you can listen to the next edition of the official Cherries podcast. But from myself, Chris Temple, from Neil Perrett and from our guest Jack Wilshire, thanks for listening. It's bye for now.